morning. I want to talk to you about big data and how big data changes the nature of tattoos. As you're thinking of those two things coming together, one of the things you might think about is big data and what is big data and are we really in a period of big data? So in about 2011, we generated about 1.8 zettabytes, which is one with 21 zeros behind it. So as you're thinking about a one with 21 zeros behind it, it sounds like an awful lot of data, and it's about as much data as humans generated in all of its history through about 2004, 2005. So you take every piece of paper, every photograph, every film, everything said, everything sung, and that's about a zettabyte. And as you think about imaging a single human brain and you do it at a synapse level, which requires an electron microscope, according to Sebastian Sung, that will take about two zettabytes. So imaging a single brain on the one hand is equivalent to all the data that humans have generated through about 2004, 2005, but it's now becoming conceivable. And as you think about this data and as you think about what it means to be able to store, generate, access that amount of data, it has a series of effects on the brain. And as you're thinking about the brain, what used to come into the brain is very different when we went to college than when kids go to college today. So when I went to college, you did research, and you inferred from the research. And it was basically, I think, because you had enough primary sources, you had enough secondary sources, you did enough research, that you could say, I think such and such thing is true. But now we're moving into an era of I know. So you can take two concepts, like love and war, and using Google Ngrams, trace every use of the word from 1800 to the present, and basically watch a fight between love and war, where love wins sometimes, war wins sometimes, then we enter the 20th century, and war becomes overwhelmingly dominant, twice. And now we may be entering a period of balanced love and war. Maybe. But it's a very different thing to say, I think love dominates war, than to be able to trace every single time that concept is used in a book. And as you're thinking about that transition, that's a very different period of time. Because what used to go into somebody like this brain is basically what's coming into your brain during a single day. So you take a lifetime of data coming into a Neanderthal brain or a Cro-Magnon brain out of a landscape that basically looked like that, and they're now living in a very, very different structure. And that has consequences, right? Because now all of a sudden, as we think about what's coming into these brains, we start thinking about tattoos. Right? <laughs> I mean, that's obvious. <laughs> now, why are you thinking about tattoos? Well, among other things, because tattoos is one of those ways of transmitting data across time. So this is the oldest known tattoo. This is a wonderful guy called Otzi, who ended up having Italian citizenship by 100 yards, because he died in Austria, but then the glacier brought him down, and he was... <laughs> 100 yards inside Italy when he was discovered, so he was claimed from the Austrians, and they fought over him, but he's now ended up in a South Tyrolean museum. And you can see those little tattoos on his back. And what that's telling you is tattoos last a long time. Right? Now, every parent knows that. <laughs> and as you're thinking about that, and your kid shows up and says, I'm going to get a tattoo, you kind of go, well, okay. Tattoos can be intriguing, and sometimes beautiful, and sometimes they can denote that you're a part of a group, a part of a military, a part of a gang, a part of something that will bewilder you for all time. But tattoos can sometimes also be serious mistakes, right? <laughs> and so you really got to think about tattoos, because they can last a long time. And as you're thinking about tattoos, even tattoos fade. Even tattoos eventually go away. Except, what happens if today's tattoos make us immortal? Because today's tattoos are a little bit different. Today's tattoos do the same thing for us that Turritopsis does for itself. This is the only immortal creature that we know of in the world. Basically, it reverts into a polyp and then grows again, and reverts into a polyp and grows again. So we don't even know what the lifespan of this thing is, 
And that's what's happening to us with tattoos. And the reason why it's happening to us with tattoos is because of things like Google. So what if Google equals immortality? Well, let me explain that a little bit further. What if Facebook, Twitter, Google, Tumblr, et cetera, end up being electronic tattoos? And if they are electronic tattoos, visible to many across time, and you don't even physically have to be there to see the tattoo, what happens if this stuff lasts far longer than the body does? And if we start thinking of all these electronic gizmos and photographs and comments and tweets as electronic tattoos, then, in the same way as celebrities and presidents were chased by paparazzi, now you're being chased by all your friends on Facebook. And the consequences of that stuff is it's getting really hard to hide, and that, of course, starts happening decades ago, but is now accelerating. Whether you know it or not, you are probably all really familiar with this picture. And the reason you're really familiar with this picture is because that guy right there is holding a little film camera in his hand, and the guy on the ground is Rodney King. And so, as you think about how Rodney King was tattooed for the rest of his life, because somebody was sitting there holding a camera, that is what is now happening to all of us. And now you too are being chased day and night by thousands of friends, followers, rewriters, reviewers, photographers, cookies, GPS, phone trackers, and security cameras. And each of those electronic tattoos is beginning to tattoo part of your life and who you are and who you're with and what you think and what you do and how it works. And now your life is beginning to look like this. And as you think of the consequences of that, think about what pattern recognition is doing. So pattern recognition now applies to faces. So when you look through a modern camera, it looks like this, and it focuses on the face, and it makes sure you don't wiggle, and it takes out the red eyes, and it's, it does all kinds of neat things. But in the process of doing those neat things, one of the things that's happening is it also makes face recognition possible. And so you can use your mobile phone and point it at somebody and focus on the face, but also get pattern recognition with an 84 to 94% accuracy. Which means basically you can point your cell phone at somebody and find all the pictures that people have taken of you or of one of your friends. And sometimes it does make mistakes, but when it makes mistakes, it'll misidentify you, sometimes with your father, sometimes with a first cousin. It's not a random mistake. And as you think of the consequences of this stuff, it means you can go to a random bar and point your cell phone at somebody, like the guy with the open white shirt, and basically get his Facebook, Google, Twitter, academic citations, criminal records, Tumblr, Wikipedia, reunion notes, and LinkedIn as a first pass. <laughs> and then you can decide, do I want to talk to that person? <laughs> right? But that's a very different way of getting to know somebody. Because that person, all of a sudden, you know, isn't just wearing a tattoo so you know he's a Hells Angels or you know he's an ex-Marine. That person's wearing something that is going to last a long time that tells you actually an awful lot about that person. And as you think about this stuff, what happens if Andy Warhol turned out to be wrong? So what happens if it isn't fame for 15 minutes? Right? What happens if this is stuff that lasts way beyond 15 minutes? And in the same way as tattoos sometimes go away when you're buried, these tattoos may not go away when you're buried. For better and for worse, because tattoos can be beautiful, they can be intriguing, but occasionally you don't want to wear certain tattoos. So one good rule of thumb when your kid wants to get a tattoo, maybe to say to your kid, just imagine what mom would look like with that, that tattoo. And if the answer is cool, go ahead and get it. What happens if we're getting close to immortality with this stuff? Deliberately or not deliberately, what if these electronic tattoos really are getting us close to a stage where we are becoming quasi-immortal as this stuff follows us across time? Well, here's two ways of thinking about immortality. One way is Montesquieu, who delights in thinking of himself as a god, and in a sense, when you cross that barrier to immortality, you're moving from a human being into a god. And the other is Borges. 
See, when Borges, the great South American writer, was being threatened by the goons in the junta, they came to him and they said, we're going to kill you. And he laughed. And he said, you folks are so unimaginative. How else can you threaten other one with death? If you truly want to scare me, the interesting, the original thing, would be to threaten somebody with immortality. And that, of course, is what we're all being threatened with. And, of course, that's something that we've aspired to, because the world's great religions have always talked about circles of life, have talked about resurrection, have talked about living forever. And now we may just be granted that wish. But, of course, be careful what you wish for, because you just might get it. Thank you very much.